been talking about yeah. steel a lot yeah, this morning. Yeah, and he's making a lot of the front pages. Inside the mirror, they've gone with um, sparks will fly this morning. An interesting graphic. We're talking about more than 30,000 British jobs. But uh, they, they break it down in the mirror to you, Yorkshire and the Humber is where most of the steel workers' jobs are, 9,500, only just slightly less than that in the whole of Wales, more than 9,000 there. So, you know, if those tariffs stay around for a very long period of time and really affect the global steel market that's you know that's where a lot of jobs in the uk may well be affected at some point day since the introduction of new rail timetables on networks across England. The changes were meant to bring improved punctuality and more services, but the result for some passengers, well, it's been the opposite, yeah, hasn't it? Yeah, at least 147 trains cancelled or part cancelled on the 20th of May. And that figure almost doubled then to 281 cancellations on Monday of this week. Uh, Tony Miles is the editor of Modern Railways magazine and joins us now. Good morning. Morning. Um, I'm going to try to start on a positive note. Is there any sign at the end of this week that things are getting better? Uh, slowly, yes. By the way, I'm not the editor, so before, in case the editor's okay. watching... Oh, OK. It, okay. Just yeah. promoted you. <laughs> Just promoted right, Sorry. So a, oh, my, maybe my life's getting better. Yes, um, <laughs> what, uh, what the train companies are trying to do, particularly uh, Northern, I've been speaking to a lot recently, uh, are looking uh, at getting some kind of interim timetable in that guarantees passengers uh, of the trains that will be running um, while they sort out the, the difficulties behind the scenes. So people that go on their apps or online to find out what services are there will get some certainty, hopefully, from next week as, as to what trains will be actually there, there to serve them. Just rewind it a little bit. What is the problem? The problem in the north of England is particularly that Network Rail is running very late on some major infrastructure programmes, particularly electrifying the route through from Manchester to Bolton and Preston. Um, it's nearly a year late, could be even more than a year late. And because this keeps rolling on and they're not being certain when it will be finished, there's, there's no scope to train drivers to drive different trains that they'll be driving on the routes. Um, and, and they keep uh, asking for extra time to do work, and so they're changing timetables at very short notice, which means drivers are in the wrong place, trains are in the wrong place. And we heard earlier on breakfast that some rail users in Leeds last night saying it has just been an utter nightmare. Cancellations, not knowing where, not being able to trust the system to get to and from work and to, to visit people. I mean, have you ever known anything quite like this? I've never seen anything as, as bad. I think part of the problem is the railways are so congested now that if you get a, a small problem in Manchester or Preston, it ripples right across the country. It affects trains going to London, it affects trains going to Leeds and Yorkshire. Uh, so so th that's, the, that's the nature of the, how the railways are working now. It's interesting you should mention that because the Mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham, who is on the programme later, says if this problem was happening at this level in the south of England, much more will be do being done about it. Do you think that's fair to say? Is it affecting <laughs> everywhere anyway? Uh, well, it is, and they're having their own problems in the south of England anyway, so that they have got problems. It's, it's not so much related to network rail there, and, and this is the big problem uh, in the north of England particularly, that the projects are late, and there's a, there's a lack of communication even within network rail uh, between the engineers and the people who are planning timetables, so the engineers aren't telling the timetable people there will be problems and we need to close the railway, and so the timetable people are, are preparing for services that can't run. So for the poor people who are standing on a platform mm. this morning and waiting for a delayed train and then finding it's being cancelled, that is no consolation, is it? It isn't, no. And uh, so, so the first thing is to give them some certainty, even if there are going to be fewer trains running for a while, to give them the certainty of what will be there and to, to make sure that that's robust. Um, th there's been a little bit of a problem with the drivers not wanting to work any overtime as well, which has compounded it. Uh, there's, a, there's an offer, I understand, on the table to them to get them... Uh, to work some extra hours, which again would help. So it's, it's a case of the, the, the drivers and the industry pulling together and passengers, once they've got some certainty, being understanding for, for a while while we get things sorted. That's interesting to say that because twice in the last couple of weeks I've been waiting for trains and I've heard this announcement like there are no drivers available. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that, that used to be quite a rare occurrence, but is that just anecdote? Is that just my imagination? No, is that, that is the, the problem because uh, they've got enough drivers to run the services if they were all in the right place at the right time when they were all trained to drive the right trains in the right place. And with all those things not stacking up, they are literally making it up uh, hour by hour, seeing who's available. If a driver's late to take the next train, is there anyone to fill the gap or is the train just going to park there with passengers on? And, and it really is, uh, people are seeing uh, on the station the details of the train they want to catch and then it vanishes. So if Zinazin Zidane really is looking for a new yeah. challenge this morning, a new job that could, uh, you know... There give it him, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. absolutely. If he can train driver in the UK. With all those trophies, maybe he can fix the trains. Thank you so much. Thanks.
Now, there's uncertainty for thousands of UK steel workers after Donald Trump imposed tariffs on steel and aluminium imports. Yes, and now the European Union, Canada and Mexico are all saying they will retaliate against the United States for that decision. Sean is here to tell us more, and this sounds serious. Yeah, it is, and particularly if those retaliations end up being put into place, all of a sudden you have a back and forth over trade, over billions of pounds of trade between the United States and the European Union, and of course as part of that the UK. And that's, there are many workers behind that in many sectors. Consumers can be affected as well. So Donald Trump's doing this because he wants more steel production in the US. So wants less use of all that steel that's made around the world. But that has a knock-on effect for all these places that he's putting this tariff on. For example, you take the UK, the International Trade Secretary here, Liam Fox, he's not impressed with the decision. It's very disappointing that the United States has chosen to apply steel and aluminium tariffs to countries across the European Union, allies of the United States and all in the name of national security. And in the case of the United Kingdom, where we, steal, we send steel to the United States that is vital for their businesses and the defence industry, it is patently absurd. So absurd. That's a strong word to use when you're talking about decisions made by Donald Trump and trade. Uh, we're going to be talking to the boss of the UK steel sector, the trade body there, who's been talking with the government, representing businesses in the UK as part of all these negotiations. We're going to be talking to him in about 10 minutes' time. Is there any possibility that Trump is actually using this statement as a negotiated tactic in a way? We've seen him do this before, haven't we, to say these really radical, shocking things and then somehow step back a little bit. Oh, absolutely. The reason these, in, these tariffs are in place is because there hasn't been an agreement. The EU haven't come back to America and said, I tell you what, we'll give you something back. There's been an end of negotiations at this point. So he said, fine, we're going ahead with these taxes. That's exactly what he's after. Lovely. Thank you very much, Sean. We'll talk to you later. In other news this morning, the Transport Secretary Chris Grayling may be forced to appear in front of a select committee of MPs because of the chaos that's been caused by those changes to the rail timetable. Two troubled train operators, Northern Rail and Govia Thameslink, were responsible for almost a thousand cancelled or delayed trains in just one day. Well, commuters at Leeds train station have been telling breakfast how the new timetable is affecting their journeys. It's been a bit of a shambles, really. Like, obviously. I expect to finish work and get home at a certain time and then with all the train delays and that I don't end up getting home until sometimes one, two hours later than what I should be and I've been late for work numerous times. Every day I'm late for work, myself and my partner commute from Horsef to um, Leeds. They, don't, they announce that it's delayed after it's delayed um, and we just have to put up with that every day which is a bit of a nightmare to be honest. I left Rill 20 minutes late and then uh, the train to Manchester was delayed and then the Newcastle train that I was catching, that was delayed. Every single station from Piccadilly through Manchester, even towards Huddersfield, we were just stuck because there was so many northern trains just sat at platforms because they had no drivers. Uh, when you're having a baby, uh, where would you go to buy your cot, your crib, all that sort of stuff. Mother care was Mother the, care. the shop of choice, wasn't it, for decades? But been struggling. Yeah, people aren't going there so much anymore, quite simply. Sean has been looking into this and mother care not the force it was. No, and big day today for landlords as well, you know, that, uh, that have those mother care stores. Big decisions to be made could affect the future of it. Morning everybody, whether it's, well John mentioned a few things there, what else? you got Baby Grow, Cuddly Toy to clip on the pram. The pram itself, mother care has been struggling to sell as many of these as it used to and that's had a big effect on business. So in May, it reported a £73 million loss for the financial year after a £7 million profit the year before. Now, at the same time, it announced plans to close 50 stores, taking the total down to 78 by 2020. That will mean the potential loss of at least 800 jobs. Now, today is that big day because landlords around the country are deciding about whether they're willing to lower the rents that they charge on around another 20 mother care stores around the country. So a reflection as well of what might seem like chaos behind the scenes, the company is actually rehiring its former chief executive, a chap called Mark Newton-Jones. He was only sacked from Mother Care in April. So what on earth is going on at the retailer? Let's have a chat about all of this with Becky Waller-Davis, who is from Retail Week. Becky, good morning. Hiya. 
bit of a mess behind the scenes in some of the stores. Yeah, absolutely. I think Mothercare's just in complete turmoil at the moment. Um, as you said, the kind of hiring and rehiring of a chief executive who had been there years, the ousting of the uh, chairman who fired him, I mean, it just looks like a bit of a mess. And I think for consumers as well, uh, that's how Mothercare has ended up here. It just hasn't innovated fast enough, you know, with uh, players like Amazon coming into the market. Um, you either have to uh, kind of beat Amazon its own game um, and lower prices, which is impossible to do really, um, or you have to go off in a, a different uh, route and um, focus on kind of service. Um, and I think Mothercare has really missed that opportunity. You know, this is a market uh, where you really can connect with your customers where maybe they're first-time parents and they don't want to just shop on Amazon um, or go to one of the supermarkets. Um, and I think Mothercare has really missed that chance. Interesting. I mean, surely people would think the Mothercare brand Mm. There aren't many other brands that sort of encapsulate everything you might need to get when a newborn baby comes into your life. So what is it about what they're not doing with that brand that they should be doing? Well, look, they're on a transformation plan, but they've, you know, they've had successive transformation plans for quite a long time what, now. What does that mean? Like a okay, you work into sure. a store, and yeah. you know, what is it that the customers aren't getting that they're right. trying to okay. put in place? Um, so they need to be focusing on making the stores look a lot better. They need to be focusing on getting their prices right so that you don't end up with a load of overpriced stock and then going into sale at the end of the season and having big discount signs everywhere. Um, and I think really with Mothercare, you need to work on customer service as well. You know, I'm not a parent myself, but um, I've heard people say that actually their customer service is pretty poor. And when you're going into a shop, um, you don't want to be served by a kind of uh, a disinterested customer service person mm. if you're shopping for something really important. You want to engage with somebody mm. in that. That's a problem we've heard across quite a few uh, retailers. Yeah. Debenhams had similar problems of as course, well. Of course, yeah. Becky, thank you very much thank for you. that. Uh, Becky Waller-Davis there from Retail Week. There is uncertainty, though, for thousands of UK steel workers after Donald Trump imposed tariffs on steel and aluminium imports. And now the European Union and Canada and Mexico are all saying they're going to retaliate against the United States for that decision. Sean is here. You've been Morning. speaking to the boss of, of UK Steel about this, and, yeah. and we're talking about a potential trade war here. And this is real things happening for British steel businesses this morning. We heard from Gareth Stace, who we were talking to uh, from UK Steel. Now, he gave the example of a boat in crossing the waters on the way to the US, and if it's got a load of steel on it and it left yesterday, by the time it arrives today or tomorrow, however long it takes, that will now have a 25% tax put upon it. So big effects for businesses here, 30,000 workers. And Gareth Stace explained how that could possibly have a knock-on effect with those relationships we have with businesses in the US. I was speaking to a, a steel um, company owner only this week who, who said that he'd been supplying steel to the US to the same company for 30 years. He has a very good relationship with that company. That company still wants to buy uh, his steel. And, and, and now it's just going to cost them 25% more. So they need to work out, is that relationship going to stay? Is it going to break? You know, what has President Trump done there? So, yeah, um, you can see how that can have a knock-on effect to the, the businesses and the decisions they're making. You're selling steel for 30 years, then all of a sudden your prices are up 25%. Would that business, for example, now have to think, do I need to make more efficiencies? Or actually, is our steel of such good quality? Because it's pretty high-quality steel that the American businesses might be willing to pay that extra and it might not have the knock-on effect some are thinking. So that's why it's a really crucial one to watch over the coming days and weeks. And it's, it's going to change hour by hour, isn't it? Yeah, well, you never know. Keep an eye on Donald Trump's Twitter feed. Yeah. Yeah, like, that'll be... And also the tit-for-tat that goes on in terms of retaliation as well. Yeah, well, you've got things like, what do we import? Jeans, yeah. urban whiskey, all of these kind of things. If the European Union goes, do you know what? In return, we're going to start taxing those. Businesses in the UK would have to pay more for those. And then at what point would the consumer? This is how a trade war really starts to have an effect on a lot of people. Yeah. Sean, thank you very much.